Welcome. I'm Julie Bacon, and you're listening to the Mindset Coaching for Handlers podcast, a podcast for dog handlers who are on a mission to achieve big goals. Here I share lessons, insights, personal stories, and tools you can apply during your next show, trial, or test to help you strengthen your mental game and hopefully cue more consistently. Be sure to check out the show notes where you'll find details about the episodes, plus important links, including the link to the Dogged Planner and Workbook created just for handlers on a mission. So if you're ready to improve your competitive mindset, get out of your own way, and connect with your dog like never before, then it's time to get comfy, bring an open mind, and work your mindset. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. Okay, this week we're going to talk about ring nerves. And ring nerves are something that we've talked a lot about over the years, but we haven't talked about it recently, I realized. And so I feel like all of us could use a bit of a refresher for ring nerves. So the first thing is, is ring nerves come from all kinds of places, right? They, their origins can be a little slippery. They can come from the fact that we put pressure on ourselves, right? We put that, which is internal pressure, you know, the pressure that we put on ourselves to do well. Then there's the pressure that other people are putting on us, whether it's a significant other, or maybe your breeder's there this weekend to watch, or, you know, some other mentor, or maybe some mean girls or whatever are there watching you. And that feels like external pressure pressure to do good and that can make you nervous, right? So other things are just, you know, the desire to do well, just wanting really a certain result or wanting a certain outcome or just wanting to do well. Um, sometimes not wanting to embarrass ourselves is is a point of where the ring nerves come. Sometimes it's just being in a new place, a new environment or or like you've bounced up to a new class, a new level, you know, it, it's a new, it's pushing new skills for you. Maybe this, this course or this pattern or this situation is something more difficult than you've experienced before. Um, you know, ring nerves come from all kinds of places. And at their core, they are, you know, a type of performance anxiety. Now, the word anxiety is kind of loaded or it can be kind of loaded. And so I tend to save the word anxiety for something that is more severe than, you know, the old butterflies, right? And we're going to explain where those butterflies come from in a second. But um, but you can use your vocabulary however you like, right? Um, but performance anxiety is really that ability or that that concern that you're not going to be able to perform the way that you either want to or think you should or know that you can. You you just aren't sure. That you just have doubt about whether or not it's going to work out the way that you want it to. And the thing is, the truth is, is nobody knows whether or not it's going to work out the way we want to, right? Um, if we were that good at the future, telling the future, we would all be, you know, multiple lotto winning people, right? With the winning numbers ever at our ready. So that is something we cannot predict. And that's a lot of where nerves come from as well is our inability to control everything, right? We want to be able to control. We want to just know, just tell me what's going to happen or just let me control this piece of it. Or I wish I could control what the judge is going to say, or, you know, I wish I could control my dog even, or etc. So that's the other part of it is when we step into a sport, we are stepping into an arena, yes, pun intended, um, where we don't control all the variables. We're not. We're going to try like hell. We're going to put our best foot forward. We're going to do our best preparation. We're going to do all of our things. But at the end of the day, we don't control everything. And that is really unsettling to some people. And so again, you know, this ring nerves, these things are coming from all kinds of places. And before I go into how we're going to help them, I also want to pick apart under and so that you can understand a little better what is happening when you start to get nervous, all right? Because there's a physiological aspect to this that can, I think, can really make our ring nerves even worse because what happens is our, then our 
if you will, not just our minds are involved, but now our body starts to get involved. And there are some physiological things that happen, some like systems that kick in that if we don't interrupt the system, they sort of snowball. They have their own like timeline almost, and they're just going to do what they're going to do unless we intervene. So I feel like knowing how this works in our bodies is just as important when we want to interrupt it, get in back in control of ourselves and really be able to do our best thinking. Because some of us, when we feel that performance anxiety, some of us forget the course, we forget what we're doing. Um, we don't, we're, we're late on getting certain cues in and some of us do the really hard part and then let up on the easier part or take those things for granted because our minds just aren't working the same, the way that we want them to work. And there's actually a physiological reason for that. So the first thing we have to do is agree that underneath performance anxiety, ring nerves, whatever you want to call that is fear, right? It It's a fear of not knowing what's going to happen or wanting something so badly that, you know, that we want it to happen, but we're afraid that it's not going to happen. And as humans in today's society, we don't really throw the F that F word around very much. We don't really say that we're fearful or afraid. It's not cool, right? We'd rather say, oh, I've got ring nerves. I've got butterflies. I've got performance anxiety. It's not cool to say, I'm afraid it's not going to go the way I want it to, right? We just don't talk that way. So, um, but at its core, it is fear that we're feeling. So what happens when fear comes to us, it has, like I said, very specific physiological things that happen. The first thing is, is the front part of your brain, the frontal cortex, that part of your brain that is responsible for planning, thinking, remembering a course, um, remembering what you're going to do when you get in the ring, you know, all of that. That is the part of your brain that looks around and says, "Ooh, here's a situation how should I feel about this situation? Because your frontal cortex is really about planning and strategy. It's not so much about feeling. But your middle brain, the mid part of your brain, is responsible for emotions and feelings. So your front brain says, hey, here's a scenario. And your mid brain goes, oh my God, we should be worried. We should be afraid. We should be concerned. This is a thing. I'm going to be nervous now. Like, oh, what is, the, oh, oh no. So as soon as it says, oh no, it sends that signal back to the amygdala, aka the lizard brain, and the lizard brain goes, got it. I know what to do when we're afraid. And what the lizard brain does is what it has done for millennia. It sends signals to throughout your body, which include redirecting blood flow away from things like your brain and digestion, and two, your big muscle groups, your lungs, and your heart. Because if you're afraid, it must be a bear, right? We must be in danger. We must be in physical danger. And because that was the origin of our physiology, that still happens today. So your blood flow is going to your big muscles. It's going to your heart. It's going to your lungs. And it's not going to worry about digesting that muffin from this morning. And it's also not going to worry about whatever plan you just cooked up. Your blood flow up to 30% is redirected. So your heart is also beating faster. Your lungs, your breathing is probably more shallow. You are feeling those butterflies in your stomach because again, your blood flow just left the building, right? Your blood flow is in your thighs, you know, it's not in your stomach anymore. And so that's affecting you and it's not in your brain anymore. So you might even get a headache when you get nervous, you know? You might give yourself a migraine as I once did when you're nervous or excited. And uh, the other thing that happens is your system is flooded with hormones, including cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So all of this stuff happens and it happens in a nanosecond. And so sometimes what's interesting is people will just be hanging out at the ring and they'll be like, oh, weird. I don't know why my stomach feels like funny or I don't know why that's weird. I have a headache. So, or my breathing is a little shallow or the, my fingertips are a little numb or tingly or whatever. And so sometimes our physical signs are what sort of says that, Hey, I guess I'm nervous. Like even before we're really conscious of it in our frontal cortex, right? So when all of that is going on, 
think about what, I mean, just logically think about what it must do to our ability to perform, right? Well, it's reduced, right? Our ability to remember the course or remember the healing pattern is reduced. We might make silly mistakes because we really aren't fully present, you know, thinking through everything. Um, and all of these things, we think about what our dogs pick up on. You think they're not picking up on your increased heart rate or your, you know, change in breathing, you know, some people will like chew on a peppermint because they've heard that it changes, you know, there's something about their breath. Well, sure. But your dog's probably picking up on these other signals too. So like go with the peppermint, but also know that they're probably picking up on your, the heart rate and some of these other factors. So I bring all of this up not to scare you, but to tell you that there are ways to take control of these parts, these things that are happening and basically intervene right? Because we want to stop that cycle so that we can redirect blood flow back to the brain, back to our stomachs, back to all the places it needs to go right down to your fingertips and really get back in our, in our thinking. Okay. The other thing that happens, or I want to call out, I should say, is that those same things, all of those same things that I just listed off are the exact same things that happen when you are excited for good excited to go to a concert, excited to, you know, go to the nationals or the invitationals or, or just your local trial, you know, those are the same things that, that happen to you when you're excited. So what I have found in handlers is sometimes they are misinterpreting excitement and calling it fear or fear and calling it excitement. And sometimes you can be both things. You can be both nervous and excited. I've done that. I did that my first year at, at that, or the first time I went to the Invitational, for instance, I was both nervous and excited, probably equal parts, who's to know, but I can tell you, I gave myself a migraine on the first day, right? And so, and if I really stand back and look at it, it was probably both. The, and so one feeds the other and, you know, pretty soon your body is in this kind of mode that you're not really thinking clearly, your blood flow is off, everything's just kind of off physiologically, yet you are expecting yourself to perform at your best. And it's not logical. It's not logical that anyone in that physiological state could perform at their best. It does not make sense. So what we want to do, whether you are excited or whether you are fearful and you're feeling the butterflies or the headache or whatever it is that you're feeling for whatever reason, we want to get back in control of that. And we can. That's the good news. So one of the fastest ways is to use your breathing, your breath work, because as I said, your breathing is is thankfully, we don't have to think about it all the time. You know, our amygdala takes care of that. And when we are under stress, again, excitement or fear, the lizard brain is like, okay, breathe faster, breathe faster, (laughs) breathe faster. And so what we can do is we can actually stop and we can control our breath right? It's one of those things that we don't control, but we can take control if we want. And we can take three big, long, deep breaths. Ideally, if you are sort of holding it in between. So a big breath in, hold it for a couple of counts, and then a long breath out and hold that for a couple of counts. And when we do that, seems simple, but when we do that, what we are signaling to our bodies, to our amygdala specifically, is that hang on, I am in control of my breathing. I can control this and we're safe. We're okay. And just think if you were being chased by a bear, you are not going to stop and work on your breath work. Okay. You're not going to be like, hang on bear. I just want to do this real quick. Okay. So just the fact that you are able to take control and take those breaths has a profound impact on your brain, your response in that physiological kind of automatic response that you are in right now. Okay. Or in, in that moment, I should say. So that's one thing you can do. Thankfully, you take your breathing with you wherever you go. And you can do that at the ring when you're a few dogs out. I like to do that as part of my ritual. Just make sure I'm taking a few deep breaths here and there. Like whenever I think about it, just really like feeling the ground underneath my shoes and all of that and just making sure that I am present and I can do that. So that's just a good habit to get into, but that will really have a profound effect. Another one that I really like that is very accessible to us is distraction. 
And distraction comes in all kinds of forms. If you are, you know, feeling nervous all day, you can, you know, stop yourself, go take yourself for a walk, go shop at some vendors, go get yourself out of the environment, go listen to music, go think about anything else, you know, talk to people, you know, when, when I say walk around, walk around without your dog, just go, just go, get out of your own head for a while and just do something different. You know, some people will plan their phones, numb out, you know, that way, play a game or something. It's a good, it's a decent form of distraction. It's not my favorite form, but if you're crushing it on Candy Crush, like knock yourself out and use that as distraction. It can be very calming. The other way, the other thing I like to do is I like to ask myself or someone else can do this for you if they recognize that you're getting nervous. Um, ask yourself like a stupid question, okay? And the question has to be like just just smart enough that it makes you think for a second. So I've done the thing where I've looked down at my pants and I've said, where did I get these? Like, how old are these? Like, do I need, like, where did, I wonder if they were on sale when I bought them or I wonder if I paid full price. And is that useful information if I'm five dogs out? No, like who cares? But the point is, is like, I have to think about it. I have to stop and actually think about the answer. And what that does is it forces blood flow back into the front of your brain, the part of your brain that actually has the answer to that. And it makes you think about like, oh, well, actually, yeah, I did get them here. And I, oh, yes, you know what? Someone gave me a gift card and I was able to use my gift card on these pants. Yeah, huh? they've held up pretty well. And all of a sudden, I'm in this completely different place and thinking about completely different things because I've literally shifted the blood flow in my body to be more in my front part of my brain, which is the part of my brain that is in charge of running this dog. And just that little bit of distraction can get me reconnected to the present moment, get my blood flow kind of balanced out. Maybe it reminds me to take a few deep breaths, make it, you know, maybe it reminds me to do some other part of connection to my dog and just gets me back to where I need to be, back into the present, okay? So those things are really important when we are starting to feel the, um, the effects of being nervous, the effects of having that performance anxiety. So in one second, I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you why another reason, another thing we can do, but it's more of a systemic thing that we need to change when it comes to how we view our runs. All right, be right back. This is a shameless plug for my dogged planner. I created a planner, workbook, and journal designed just for handlers with big goals. It's been years in the making and it is finally available and I'm super proud of it. The link to learn more is in the show notes, but quickly, the Dogged Planner has goal setting pages, title tracking, a place to record health information, in-season date capture, notes pages, and monthly and weekly calendars. The workbook is everything except the calendar. And the journal is blank for seminar notes, rehab plans, training notes, agility stickers, or whatever else you may need. All are available on Amazon and are made to order. So if you're serious about slaying your goals this year, then you need the Dogged Planners. So when it comes to ring nerves, performance anxiety, etc., there is another underlying factor that I think happens with everybody. And as I dig into this with with people in coaching sessions, etc., it comes up again and again. And that is the outcome. All right. The reason most people are nervous at all, well, first of all, is because they care. Okay. So the first thing I want to say, if you're a little nervous, like I hope I'm always a little nervous. I don't want to be a lot of nervous because a lot of nervous, I can't perform as well. But a little nervous, I like to be a little nervous because it reminds me that I care and it can make me sharper. Okay. So I want you to realize too that some nerves are good. But your version of nervous and my version of nervous and your version of just right, aka Goldilocks just right, and my version of just right are really different, okay? I like to be a little more on edge. I think I perform better that way. If I am too relaxed, if I'm just chill, it's not good. (laughs) It's not good. I need to have a little sharpness in my day. Okay. Um, A little edge. All right. But for some people, my edge is way too much. All right. And um, 
So that's important to know. And it's important that you know that about yourself and you even make a couple notes in your planner or your journal or something like that so that you are tracking that so that you know how to bring yourself up and down. I think of it as like a dial, right? If I need to dial it up or dial it down, I can dial it up and down through music, right? That's one of my go-to tools when I'm at a trial, especially an agility trial and I'm using it, I'm listening to music when I do my walkthrough. I listen to the same song over and over again. Those of you who've been listening to me go on about this also know that I've been known to listen to the same song for a season, for a year, for a whole dog's agility career, right? My first dog, it was one song, (laughs) okay? And I use it because it's an earworm and I want the earworm because I want whenever my brain scatters. I want to go back to that song, which puts me back in the place of walking the course, which puts me back in the place of knowing what my plan is, right? So it, for me, it is a powerful tool, okay? But I can, through that tool, then ratchet my focus back in and get back in the present moment using what ends up being an earworm, okay? So it's a really effective tool for me. But the thing is, is you have to know, you have to learn about yourself when you are too casual, when you are too amped up, and what is your happy medium, and how do you calm yourself down, or how do you amp yourself up, okay? That's a really important thing to know, okay? Really, really important. Okay, so back to the role that outcome goals and results play in our uh, nerves, in our performance anxiety. So very, I don't know that I've ever talked to a handler in a coaching session who said she was really nervous about, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, keeping connection with her dog or um, she was nervous about cueing early enough or nervous about picking her dog up right before the about turn in the heel healing pattern or picking your dog up out of the tunnel. No one is, those are all process goals. And I've never talked to a handler that was nervous about a process goal, right? Because process goals are things that we are in control of, right? All of those things I just listed off, I'm very much in control of whether or not I do that. Yeah, yeah, I got to remember to do it in most cases, okay? But I'm in control of being able to do that. and And I know I have the skills to be able to do that. Right? I know I have the skills to make eye contact with my dog as they come out of the tunnel. I know I have the skills to glance down at my dog before I do an about turn in a healing pattern. I have the skills to do that so long as I remember to do it, which is you know part of my rituals before I walk into the ring is to remind myself to do that. I'm in control of those process goals. No one's ever nervous about those because they're in control of them. Right? What we're nervous about are the outcomes. What we're nervous about is the result is the fact that did I cue? Was I clean? Did I do all 20 obstacles correctly? All 20 things that were asked of me? Did I do not just the healing pattern right, but like the on leash, the off leash, the stand for exam, the recall, the, you know, that, right? We, we add them all up in our heads and we only then get nervous about the result. Well, 20 things have to go right in order for you to get from the start line or when you walk in the ring to when you walk out of the ring with a cue. And it is too much to think about. And your brain is like, it's too much to think about. And your brain gets very nervous about the fact if that it can cue, that it can get to the outcome, that it can get to that result. Because on some level, subconsciously, um, your brain knows that like, whoo, that's a lot. Like a lot has to go right. And I'm not in control of a lot of that. I'm not in control of what the judge says. I'm not in control of if something weird happens while I'm in the ring. I'm not in control of, you know, whether my dog trips, you know, or whatever, right? We influence our dogs. We're not in control of our dogs. And so we get nervous about that because we have this outcome in mind that we want, yet we know that we're not in fully in control of getting it. We know that there's all these things that have to go right, all of these variables that have to fall into place between the beginning and the end for it to work out the way we want. But we can control the process goals, right? We can control how we show up. We can control our mindset. We can control um, our our breathing, right? For instance, as we just went through. Those are things we can control. And the thing I like to say to people is if you focus on your process goals, you are focusing on the focusing on the things that you need to do in order to put yourself in a position to cue, 
right? I can do all the things right. My dog can do all the things right. We can have the run of our lives and the judge makes a call that I don't agree with. But it's not my ring, it's the judge's ring, right? In that moment. And that's happened, right? We all, everybody's got a story. Get us around the dinner table. We'll all tell you stories, okay? So we need to focus on our process goals. And when we focus on our process goals, we focus on things we control. When we know that we are in control, we calm down. We just naturally do because we're no, we know that we can do that thing. We know that we can do the thing that we're, being, that we're asking ourselves to do. And then our confidence improves and our confidence improves and our nerves go down. And then we know that we can do this and we start feeling better about being able to do this. So when we focus on our process goals and leave the outcome goals to the gods, right? To, to the agility or the obedience or the draft gods and we leave it to that, we're in a much better frame of mind and we are in a much better way that we can think about it, that we can approach it, and we have a much better chance at executing. So I would say that the number one thing behind all of this fear and nerves and even the excitement is the outcome, is the result. And if you are so focused on the result, if you are really that nervous, you're, you're kind of, what I always say is you're already on your way home. You're already at the end. You're already at the out gate. You're already, it's already over because what you're focusing on is the end of the day. Now, I'm not saying don't visualize. I'm not saying don't, you know, try to manifest or do some other things. That's a separate conversation. We're talking about why you're getting nervous, okay? And you're getting nervous because you're focusing on the outcome. So, you know, great um, kind of example, those of you who are headed to the invitational, first of all, I've got a great um thing in my, check the show notes because I put together a prep session for you. So there's a great prep session in my notes, uh, show notes for that. But if you're heading to the invitational, you know, everybody is thinking about like, oh, the breed medallion or like going clean, or it's the first time I'm going to run in front of all of these people. Those are all outcomes, right? You need to focus on what it is that you can do. You need to do the things that got you there, right? You need to do the things that will put you in a position to be able to cue. Okay. So as you're thinking through your ring nerves, as you're starting to get, you know, amped up, just kind of go back to basics, go back to the breathing, go back to the distracting, go back to the music, go back to those things that ground you, um, take your dog for a walk, go, go back to the things that work. Okay. Go back to the things you control, go back to the, your process goals, right. And leave those beautiful outcome goals and those things that you want you know, to how they're going to work out. They're going to go how they're going to go. What you can control are those process pieces. Okay. So think about that. That's a really good kind of refresh for those of you who needed it or haven't heard my, you know, thing on ring nerves. Um, But it's also a really good primer for anybody headed to Orlando next month. Um, Like I said, get that um, little prep session that's in my show notes And, um, really like on your weekends now, like whether you're going to Orlando or not, but just in your coming weekends, this weekend, wherever you're headed right now, just think about like, how do you feel physically, right? When you go to run, what is a good day for you? Are you a little bit on edge? Do you have a little bit of that like intensity going? Do you like it to be a little intense or do you like it to be really calm? Like develop some awareness around what your preferences are. Because without knowing what your preferences are, like let's say it's a scale of one to 10 and you like to run at like a three, right? You like the intensity low, the pressure low, the ring nerves low. You like to be relaxed, right? Actually, if you could be a two or a one, you'd be really thrilled. You like to be relaxed. Well, I would probably answer that question as an eight. Like I really like to run at an eight. I like to be more intense. I like to be more, I feel like being more on edge makes me sharper, right? I'm one of those people that makes me more focused in the moment. It just makes me, you know, sharp and it brings my focus to the present moment more, right? Where, where I'm relaxed, I entertain a lot of other inputs, right? That I really don't need to be thinking about. So the first step in all of this is get some awareness this weekend or like this week or whatever you're doing about like what it is, how do you like to run? Like how do you like it to go down for you? What do you like to be? Because without knowing what you're aiming for, 
let's again say it's a number, then how do you know how to get there, right? If you don't know that you like to run at a six, how do you know how to dial it up or dial it back, okay? So this conversation is a big conversation, right? It's the source of a lot of the coaching that I do, you know, really helping people through this. And so um, I'm throwing a lot at you on this particular episode. I urge you to go back through some of the older episodes and if you if this is something you need to learn more about because um, it's so hard to pack it all in. Um, but start by thinking and get getting that awareness around what is your ideal? What is your ideal amount of nerves or edge or whatever your word is for it, your intensity maybe, and start there and then start thinking about ways that you can you know, dial it in, dial it down. And then secondly, I want you to go back, especially if you were doing this in the beginning of the year and you're not doing it anymore, go back and really think about your process goals. Think about the things you can control, focus on the things you can control and leave everything else to chance. Okay. So no matter what you're doing this week or this weekend, I hope you have a fantastic week with your dogs. Thanks so much for listening to the Mindset Coaching for Handlers podcast with me, Julie Bacon. I am so grateful for your precious time. Check out my Dogged Planner workbook and journal available on Amazon. Just search for Dogged Planner. I also offer monthly membership that's perfect for ongoing support of your awesome goals. Check out thecuecoach.com for details or just stop by and check out all the ways you can work on your mindset. And be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at The Q Coach and let me know how it's going. Finally, please share, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps us podcasters tremendously. Plus, I know I get my best podcast recommendations from friends. Thanks and have a great week with your dogs.